Uh, good evening, this is Sarah Chiu. Our program is Basket Starfish, our language core. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Tonight is my 70th, 70th episode and I am going to talk uh, more about, you know, my feeling uh, as a traveler, the things that I hear along the journey which doesn't seem to coincide with all these linguistic theories and uh, uh, bear with me and I will show you uh, the slides and show you some images to make you understand how my ear you know tune with you know the meaning of what was in front of me and as I said you know the context always is very very important okay so um, today uh, using a little bit more of the thing that I always talk about the ke and ge sound as the base you know the carpet you know from the very beginning then human beings sit on the ground until we elevate ourselves until uh, now but this week I put a little bit more attention in the sa sound you know the s you know since i talk enough about the uh, k and the and the g sound you know in terms of our seat you know so uh, you will understand me better when i show you the slides okay so i will start it from the beginning Okay, once again, um, this is the basket starfish, you know, so I believe that uh, our language all share one common core. All of us are just a branch of the same family. So we are not from different family trees. So uh, because uh, if we believed in that, it ushered in human hierarchy and everything is seemed like linear and then one uh, culture pass it on to other, which is not true. We are all standing on equal ground. So uh, I think that the way of looking at uh, our history linearly needed to be changed okay so um, it's uh, when you look up the dictionary and when you look at all the etymology of the words they always told you somehow it get uh, go back to Greek or sometimes just to Latin as if they just invent a word out of the blue you know at that time or after or you know they still chase it to the proto indo europe European root, you know, uh, no one seems to pay attention to what the people speak in the East, you know. So uh, for thousands of years, you know, the people lived in the East, you know, what were they speaking? So no one seemed to be looking at this because most of the linguists are from Europe, you know, so a lot of them are uh, to me, it's just mere Eurocentric view of understanding things linearly, okay. So um, again, um, I think uh, languages are living, so we have to live it and because there's a lot of elements at work you know sometimes it's not just a mutation of a sound or sometimes it's just not just uh, one understanding from one culture pass on to other hierarchically you know because a lot of different things are at work you know so um, the relationship is actually beyond writing and since English is also not my mother tongue so it seems a little bit difficult also for me to explain it but if I show you as images you would be able to understand me better okay so um, a lot of the times you know uh, sounds actually travel and as they travel they actually pick up a different or a similar meaning without our understanding it I will give you one example that I pick up you know Italian if you say you know something is true so uh, in writing you will, or in very classic Italian you will say a vero right so uh, it means that's true but uh, I noticed that in a lot of dialects just like in China you know all the dialects actually uh, either you know make things very short or sometimes they uh, shift into another sound but um, just like uh, some uh, dialectic uh, Italian they would just say away like that and then uh, when I lived in Turkey actually uh, the same sound happened to, to me and uh, but in this case they say evet you know evet in Turkish actually means yes so put you in the same context when someone ask you a question you Italian you say Eve, and then in Turkish you will say just Evet so sometimes you know the meaning is in the ear of the traveler so uh, it's not necessary you know it's, it's a linear uh, passing on a lot of the human communication actually happened very subtly and and of course you know the the, the Ottoman Empire actually had a lot to do with uh, the spreading of the Turkish language too and um, and when we say Turkish language because they move along they also bring along a lot of different uh, uh, languages too so we have to uh, train our ear to hear all this sound okay so language in real life is sometimes very very interesting 
in Italian, you know, when you say casa, it's a house, right? Home. Uh, but in, in the dialect, uh, if I'm correct, in Naples, in the area of Naples, they would just say, uh, when they say I'm going home, they would just say a gas. You know, so um, uh, visually you would say that one is a K sound, the other one is a G sound. But then the thing is that, you know, uh, when I heard that, uh, it's actually uh, aroused my curiosity because the Sangha is actually universal. This is a very, very ancient sound, meaning your base, okay? So in Sumerian, they already have a kune form like this. And the following slides, you will actually uh, see earlier Sumerian pictograph, but this is the one of the earliest kune form, and it carries the sangha or the sangja as a home, okay, or the house. As you can see, they already fence out an area. But Chinese, you know, you will see a picture like this. It's like a tent where uh, you you also uh, stay with your animals. We actually say ga. It means exactly the same thing, and in and and in Cantonese ga, okay, and then but. In Mandarin, you know, actually in Mandarin carries the sound jia. Jia is actually exactly like this sound, but the linguists prefer to write it this way. What is confusing is that normal people read it like this, but the linguists insisted in putting their own symbol. So when you read, a normal person read, they seem like a different sound, but in real life, they are exactly the same thing. So that shows you in Sumerian, you know, they also might have a dialect, you know, sound ga or jia, exactly like in Chinese, Cantonese ga and in Mandarin jia, okay? They mean exactly home. Of course, the picture is different because, you know, it was, the image was fossilized at a different time of the history, okay? So, um, in Greek, you know, when I when I try to pick up Greek, you know, the, when they say a home or house, it will say Ikea. And uh, when I heard different people say it, sometimes they say it in a different way, it exactly remind me of the Cantonese way of saying uh, the home, you know, we would say okay, okay. So it sounds very, very much like Greek itself. And interesting enough, you know, when you talk about Chinese, if Cantonese people, the way the, the people in Hong Kong speak, if we write, if we pick up Chinese writing to write out every single sound we speak in Cantonese, no Chinese would understand it. So this is something that the Western uh, culture can never understand understand because they have evolved into whatever you say can be written out but in Chinese a lot of the speech actually cannot be written out that's why we have to communicate with each other sometimes in writing because depending on the sound different shifting and different ways of speaking especially in Cantonese we actually hold a lot of ancient expression and ancient sound and if we write them out the northern Chinese would never understand what we are talking about about. This is the very interesting part about Chinese, okay? So, also in Greek, you know, cut is also means to sit. So, to sit is where you stay, to stay is where you, your home is, okay? So, even in, in, in Cantonese uh, verbal speaking, uh, sometimes when we say where you put your foot, or your feet is exactly what we mean where do you live okay so um, in hieroglyph you will say that you will see that they use a different um, uh, expression this this their goddess you will see that they are sitting on two baskets and this is the way to express foreigners you know another type of bird but they are also sitting on a nest okay or you can call it a basket and you can see that the basket in um, hieroglyph actually stand for a K sound as well so you will see that the engine actually understand things in a very subtle way where you sit your floor mat your basket your nest they all mean your home but you, if, if you pay attention, you see that home always carry this K or G sound, okay? So in Hebrew, because they lived in Egypt for more than 400 years, of course, they pick up the expression in, in, in Egypt too, right? So in Hebrew, the word sound cause actually means the throne. And as you can see, this is the throne of their goddess. So cause is all actually, you know, it means the, the, the throne, the site where you sit, okay? And so... um. 
the um, the other way of distinguishing between themselves. Ge actually for Hebrew is your, the where to live. Okay, sometimes they use it to mean you know a foreigner, a traveler, where a traveler stay and and, and live. So you will see they also use the K and the G, and the ge sound to distinguish subtly between you know uh, a local people staying or a foreigner staying. So it's still following the same rule, the ke, ke sound. Okay, so in Arabic is the guy. Okay, so um the um if I will transcribe it, it will be just G A guy. Okay, but the linguists again, you know, they like to transcribe it as Q A, whatever it is. But in real life, you will just hear that guy like this, and then if uh, you will just understand it as in Arabic. But when I lived in Yemen, you know, there's an area where they said the ancient time, you know, the Jews chose to stay near the capital Sanaa, and that area is exactly called Gar. Gar, they uh, according to the local people in Yemen, they said it's a Jewish word. So uh, I don't know, you know, you name it Jewish, you name it Arabic, but it sounds the same. It sounds also like the Chinese gar. It means a settlement of a certain people. Okay, so um, uh, this is the you have to go back to the pictorial form. Okay, the Sanskrit used this also to distinguish all the villages and the houses. Of course, uh, the house is called gaya. Okay, and then the Chinese exactly the same form for us is a means for the footstool and and some something underneath you and we have the pronunciation of gay okay and it also means your foundation and the hieroglyph has the same stool it stood for the G look at this K look at this G look at all the similarity so this ex exchange you know is actually in very very ancient time it's just not just a mutation of sound it carries a lot of deep understanding of the sound itself in different culture so let's look uh, Sumerian again. Look at this. Actually, Sumerian already had a sign like this, but turn 90 degrees sideways. It actually has the sound again as the gash. The gash actually, you know, they also use it to mean anything made of wood. Sometimes they use it to mean a base, a seat. So, do, do, do you see that all these things actually have very, very similar meaning? So the relationship between writing, I will show you some uh, very, very simple uh, uh, slide, okay? Hieroglyph will be a G. Chinese, the same will be a G or a K. Uh, or, uh, or K. Uh, actually, we have the tone of K, okay? So, Marin have the same uh, symbol, 90 degrees sideways, and Gesh, okay? The Sanskrit, the Ga, okay? So, uh, for Chinese, it actually means, you know, a seat, a footstool, and, and when you talk about the footstool, you actually have a Sumerian giri. And they also use the, uh, this as a determinative. The, look at the sound too, it actually follows. When Chinese say gay, they actually say giri. It's anything to do with the base, the foot, okay? And then the Sumerian will also have the same pronunciation for a different picture. In this case, it means the foot. The foot is where you base again, okay? And, and I follow uh, the meaning again. Again, you know, for the Chinese, it also means the, the, the base, when I use the sound K, of course, the English word basket, the second part, you know, the first part is really the base. The second part is actually following the same tradition of the K sound, and the basket is actually to mean a location since ancient time. In ancient uh, writing, they always use a basket to indicate uh, as a determinator of a city or a place where you stay, okay? So, of course, it also extends to a home and, and in um, Sanskrit it will extend to the village a city okay so let's look at again you know other than the footstool you come back to the basket in hieroglyph this is a K and this is Akkadian in Akkadian it's very clear when they use this it means you know there's the symbol of a city or a location okay it's a key sound and Chinese again the basket again we have K or K okay we have K or K Okay, and then old Persian, look 
at this. This is again psi wave, very similar to the Sumerian, but flip on the other side. It also is a K uh, uh, alphabet, okay? So just the way we look at it, look at the Chinese. When we combine this side, the basket and the footstool, we still carry the sound K, okay? It's from here that we actually get the idea of the base, the foundation, okay? So look at a few Chinese symbol again. And this is, you, you can see this, this is not an S. This is, is symbolizing a people, a person kneeling down, you know, on the basket. This is not actually a basket. You can understand it as a mat, it's a weaving, okay? So um, we also have this as a sound of gay. As this is, means where you stay, where you sit, where you live. And this is go. look at, uh, hear the sound. It definitely means where you dwell, okay? So you look at this, you know, the ancient time, you know, the people only use this sound to where, to mean where you sit, where you stay, or or where your base is okay so <clears throat> Now, because it's too much information, I want to lighten it up a little bit. This is a picture of uh, uh, Iraq, you know, and, and this is the Persian Gulf right there. And we all know that there is a, a marsh people, uh, we call them the Mandan, you know, in Iraq. These are the people who lived in patches of dry ground in a boat like this. They take advantage of all the grasses that they have in the area. Of course, in ancient times, if you have uh, grass, that that's exactly like the days uh, now, like you have oil. It's the same resources. They have expensive commodity, okay? So, but when I look at the picture, it actually reminds me of when I was a child in Hong Kong. I actually saw the similar image again and again uh, some, 50, some 50 years ago when I was a child, okay? So um, this is what I saw in the southern part of China. I'm from Hong Kong, and this is a picture that uh, um, in the 19th century, the Westerner came to uh, China. They draw about how the Western, you know, fishermen lived, you know, and and these are the names that the Chinese gave them. And of course, you know, for thou for more than 3,000 years, we call the Southern people, you know, because it's from the Northern perspective, we call them Man, okay? Man, in a way, means barbarian, you know. But as time went by, it became a little bit not politically correct, and we changed the tone if we actually call man man is actually become a tribe in the south of China where the uh, the Fujian is now at the eastern coast of China and then uh, now of course it doesn't mean as much as barbarian but man in Chinese now it's still a very very interesting people that go, uh, keeps you know their culture of sea going and the other thing there is another tribe when we call Dan this is a very very common people in Hong Kong you know, fishermen. All the uh, this Dan people is being um, westernized as the Tanka people when the westerner come. This is exactly where they uh, how they lived in the 19th century. Now I put them side by side. You see how closely they resemble each other. And actually, when I was a child, you know, some 50 years ago, I saw very similar images. And even about 15 years ago, when I was still in Hong Kong, you will see, still see houses like this you know in this round shape you know built of wood you know somewhere in their villages so um, this is what you know the old pictures were of course you know they flow around in their boats you know so they uh, the boats are their home and this is a current picture where is this Tanga people you know the so the westerner called Tanka you know this is a local uh, a recent picture this is how they evolved into of course they, they um, have a kind of abandoned this round shape but I'm sure if you go to Hong Kong in some small villages you can still see shapes like this built in some very remote villages but this is the common view you know you will see that they're still floating on the water look similar how similar they are so the West pay a lot of intention in their travel they just don't have much information about the East you know so we all use their information but I just want to contribute a little bit to see how you know 
closely uh, related these cultures are. When these people are called Mandan, and we have two types of people, one's called Man, one is called Dan. When I interview those people, you know, in the fishing villages, I still remember 15, 15 years ago, the older people still told me vaguely that they know there were two types of people. And then they actually separate them. They knew there were differences. And the verbal history actually goes on and on you know but unfortunately you know they, they never go into books they just lived on verbal history okay so now I go back, you know, to, to the formation of writing, okay? So the early Sumerian have a pictograph like this, and then the later on it becomes very clearly a mat itself. It's still pronounced as kit, okay? And then um, uh, when time went by, you will see that the sun goes on, and for them this is a ground, you know? Of course, you know, as time went by, they know how to prepare the ground. All this line you see is actually their uh, architectural skill of, uh, pounding the earth okay so this is uh, exactly what the Chinese will understand as gay when they uh, when they pound the earth into a solid ground okay so this is Akkadian you know as I say K or key is the marker of a place a city of course a city has a better uh, building management so um, now I, I show you this you know the same basket right there you can vaguely still see the basket with the handle right there the Chinese who have gay you know other than the basket the basket tree you can also weave it into a mat and then this is gay what we started as the foundation look at this earth pounder right there they add the basket they add the earth pounder okay and then as time went by of course you add two together sometimes we add another earth pounder we say k or gay okay the k these are all the chinese related you know the k or gay sound we use it you know loosely as the basket to the floor to the foundation to your seat to your footstool okay so of course you know you see the same thing right there as a footstool but before we raise our elevate ourselves of course we always sit on this or we sit on that okay so um when we come to this we i'll take you back to the ancient hieroglyph you know this is a k and then as i said you know the hebrew used this as cause as the as the throne you know this is where the goddess sits she, and then, of course, after if we elevated our ground, still, you know, the surface at the beginning was still made of weaving, you know, surfaces before we change it into wood or before we change it into leather, you know. But still the most comfortable thing will be still a weaved surface, okay. So... Um, and on also, you know, you will see that when I was a child, you know, chair and also bed were still like this. You can, nowadays, you can still find this in Yemen, in, in Persia, and also in India. All this, you know, they you will use it as a bed also. And the English uh, will call it a cot, okay? Uh, because this is a K sound still. And then the Chinese, you know, we have different setting. This is more than 3,500 years ago when we start living in, in huts and tents in the scar as a home. And the Latin we call casa. But the Latin casa is also means a cottage, okay? So a cottage is a rough building. And then all begins with, you know, uh, I take you back to the very origin. Of course, in a colder climate, you'll have, have carpet. The carpet came from the Persian word gali. The gali is also, you know, a weave and become a carpet. And the Turkish word kalim, you know, which is a, a harder hair rug, you know, uh, weave with the, with the fiber of animal, is also kalim. Okay, so all this has, again, to do with that. But again, today, you know, in order to bring you that, you know, I have to show you this, you know, the, the Sumerian already have two sounds for this, either the kit or the sa. And then, um, actually, you can understand that whenever you put down a mat, it is, it is your seat or a site of your home, okay? So that's why this sa or si actually carries on this way. And if you uh, follow the norm that people, you will see that, you know, uh, either you you describe your home as your nest a basket like this or this is a place marker okay or you can turn the basket upside down can you see that the Arcadian you know people actually 
turn the basket upside down it has a different uh, pronunciation as do of course you know it means to cover to cover of course when it's cold you need to cover yourself this is exactly if you take all the leather away it is an upside down basket okay and then it actually means a chamber this uh, of course a chamber is cover everywhere okay and then the latin actually uh, inherited this and then this uh, this is why they call dormus okay dormus is actually for them a home and casa for them is a more rough building is a cottage okay so uh, the Chinese will remain this as gar and then as I said it's gali is a carpet in Persian but look at this I have to show you this because when I lived with the Norman when I travel around actually when you go or go to a family of the Norman medic people or the Bedouin the most beautiful carpet you know they show off will be their home we imagine this you know this is the most beautiful belonging they have this gali is actually their car okay it's their casa their home okay this is how they distinguish it that's why as the uh, it evolved the chinese actually um, adopted this as, as our home okay and this is the most valuable valuable possession which is you know the carpet itself of course you know so um, i'll show you here uh, i've, I've compare four different languages you will see that this uh, the floor mat has the kit a sound and the sa sound and this is ga when the sumerian at a cover and then it has sound of ja as well it's like the mandarin ja and then the Akkadian actually only adopted all the car the the cover with the carpet so you will see that they also use this and but i want to compare this to chinese for you the chinese will have this you know you can you see the similarity this is our our mat right there and this is how we sit and then the Akkadian will have kish this is the ancient city of kish of course they mean it is a, a settlement a base for them and so uh, they have the sangun means house and abode so i think i will stop right here because otherwise you get you know too uh, uh too much information i don't want to slow it down i want you to go back and type in youtube and uh this is the uh, episode uh, 70 and type in basket starfish our language core and uh, look at all those pictures and you will get to understand how our language works because you live in the context all this sound with the image you see right in front of you this is, is actually from the human understanding